at the moment in the, you know, more than 20 countries. Maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's all, all the major European countries have it. So you know, France, Germany, um, etc. It, it's in a lot of the more obscure markets as well, like China and Russia. And I just literally the other week got my my Japanese copy of the Quarterly Air Fruit, which has a lovely, lovely manga cover. It actually looks like it should be, uh, you know, a sort of apple seed or one of those kind of main main either manga or anime. I couldn't understand a word though. It was you have to read it backwards and it's kanji script. So my, my Japanese is very bad, I'm afraid. But I like the pictures. <laughs> okay. Um, anything you would like to add? about Court of the Year, and uh, before I ask if there's questions. Um, oh, I'll go to questions, I think. I'm sure mm -hmm. people will draw elements of the book out if they're interested. So, if you have more questions, what's the six book called? Well, uh, it's, only a work, it's only a working title, okay. uh, and I think the working title I've got at the moment is The Deep of the Dark, um, okay. as, as a title, but uh, that's the one thing that the editors at HarperCollins always love to have some fun with. And, uh, so very, very rarely do, does the final title sort of get through. Did they, so did they advise you on previous titles? Yeah, on some of them, yes. The, uh, the Court of the Air, that, that was a title that just jumped out and they loved. So they, that wasn't, uh, wasn't so much of a problem. But some of the other ones, my working titles were in, in, probably a bit dry and meaningful only to me. So yes. they like to have a little bit of zap just to... Give it some marketing legs on the shelves, I think. So. Well, I think great. Mm. Uh, any more questions? Uh, in your opinion, what's your iconic steampunk novel? For me, it would be The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling. I mean, that, that was kind of pre the, the current craze that seems to be going through American, the American book market. But uh, I, I would say that's, you know, that's as good as it gets. I mean, certainly, in terms of the best written steampunk novel, I would say I would start with that if I never read anything else. Yeah. One question. Uh, I'm a little new to steampunk. Mm. Uh, well, I realized that there were stories that they were a little different, mm. but the concept of steampunk just uh, a little while to come to me. Mm. Uh, my question is, um, why is the Electricity uh, so many times put apart since electricity in our world uh, it was by steam. Mm. The first time it was produced it was by steam. Of course, so yeah. why in the stories are so many times put apart? Well, I mean, I, I think with, with the kind of pure breed um, steampunk novels, of which say the Difference Engine would be a, a very good example, they don't really have any sort of problems with electricity, if only because they're actually written at a time, you know, historically in the kind of 1830s or 1840s, before electricity really, you know, became the force of change that it did, say, in English society. I mean, electricity only really started coming into houses in about sort of 1900 and 1910, sort of 60, 70 years later. I think if you're writing a historical steampunk novel, you have no problems sort of forgetting about electricity because it just didn't exist in the same way as they wouldn't perhaps, you know, go for things like, uh, you know, nuclear power. But uh, obviously if you actually look at the books of the period like Jules of Urn and uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he has electricity as the sort of the wonder power of his submarine um, just because it was such a futuristic amazing thing so he decided to put it in there if you like um, but obviously for a lot of historical steampunk writers that, that isn't really an issue I obviously had as, as a sort of setting it millions of years in the future I needed a good reason why they weren't using electricity and why they've gone back to steam power I, I think we've had this conversation in a lot of English um, conventions as well. And one of the interesting things we always agree upon is that if there was a real bad disaster, like an extinction level event where it was an asteroid hitting the Earth or a new ice age, it's probably fair to say that most of the things that we take for granted today as a technological platform would disappear because, you know, most people would die and then, hey, you know, if you only have 10 survivors on your street, you're not really going to be able to sort of put a nuclear power plant together or, or build a, a magnetic imaging system in a hospital. You're going to go back to a certain core set of technologies, and the one core set of technologies that pretty much, you know, most people could probably go back to if they had to in a kind of post-plague 
you know, post zombie invasion universe or whatever it happened to be, it would be steam powered because, you know, you can get some metal engineering together and build a boiler and, you know, steam power is fairly accessible. Whereas, you know, pretty much everything else that we take for granted, like iPods, you know, if, if there's only five of you left in a forest, you know, the idea of like trying to knock together an iPod yourself would be a bit of a non-starter, I think. You'd be much more interested in, you know, steam power and basic water filtration rather than all the kind of higher, higher things that we take for granted today. Following that, that line of reasoning, uh, wouldn't it be uh, more natural for steam, punk, uh, for steam power to reappear, but sort of rehashed in a different way, uh, meaning uh, we would use the same uh, power source, but not the same exact technologies to draw something out of that power source? No, I think that's, that's a, a fair point. I mean, one of the, the, the things in my book is the kind of the steam and race, which is a kind of self-evolved, self-evolving artificial intelligence. They're basically nanomechanical, so they operate on a sort of nanotechnological basis. But it's just that their they're kind of their raw power source, if you like, is coal and steam. And they, you know, you can be having a conversation with one, and he'll kind of pop the boiler on his back and shovel some coal in, or maybe ask you to do it for him if your friend is your friend. Um, but I mean, you can kind of play with those those stereotypes, as I, perhaps I did to a certain degree. One of the things I wanted to do was make my robots more human than the humans. So, for instance, you've got the main the main religion of the humans is this kind of Zen Buddhism called circulism, which is basically agnostic or, or hostile to God, and they don't believe in God. But all the steam men totally believe in God, and they have a whole pantheon of sort of robot gods that they worship. So in a, in a sort of funny way, they're almost more human than the humans from that perspective. Okay. Uh, in Portugal, usually the, um, the editors uh, do not interfere very much with the writing of the, of the authors. Mm. They can make some suggestions, but usually there's not a uh, very big interference. How is it with you in, in England? Uh, you, they, they mess with your text? Like, to be honest, not much. Um, I think it probably very much depends on who you are as an author, and I think it's fairly notorious that if you are, say, J.K. Rowling, that the editors won't dare mess with, with you, because if you do, you'll just get in a sort of artistic huff and say, well, you know, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, and if you force me, I'll go, you know, take my books to a rival publisher. I think that's perhaps why you see that kind of drift in length of books as you get into, say, the uh, Harry Potter series, and a lot of people who are, who are sort of, uh, you know, literally inclined will kind of pick apart the later books and say, well, I could have done with a bit of editing there to make it a bit tighter. And uh, I think that's what you get more when you are kind of starting out off, though, is that the, the editors will feel they have more rights to take apart your work. But from what I've heard from other people in the UK, it also very much depends on who your editors are. There were some editors who I won't name in very big publishing houses who are basically frustrated authors, and they love nothing better than picking apart a novel and you know, basically pushing the author around perhaps a bit more than their natural tolerances will allow. Um, but other, other editors don't do that just because it's not in their nature. And I, I happen to have a, a very good one at Harper Collins, and we have an excellent relationship. And to be honest, where she does make kind of structural changes or suggestions for structural changes, you know, I, I will happily follow along with that, and, and I'm, uh, you know, I will trust trust her judgment implicitly. And it, it always proves. You know, to be dead on the money. And the other thing is, I have a sort of a bed of test readers, including my wife, and she she will read it. And often, the feedback I get from my wife and the feedback I get from my editor is identical. If they identify certain structural weaknesses or problems with characters, it's, they're normally saying exactly the same thing. And you know, if you've got two people who you trust saying that kind of thing, that uh, you know, you should listen to them. And I'm lucky in that respect to have those kind of that kind of relationship. I think. <laughs>